From the Cairo Radio Newsroom in Seattle, I'm Dave Ross, and these are the Ross Files. Over the summer, the Seattle School District released an ethnic studies framework for mathematics. And talk shows immediately picked up on this and said, what could possibly be ethnic about mathematics? So uh, we have with us Tracy Castro-Gill, who is the Ethnic Studies Program Manager with Seattle Public Schools. First of all, tell me the the status of this uh, ethnic math curriculum. Is it being used now, or what is it exactly? Well, the framework that went viral is a first draft. It was just finished over the summer. It was written by four uh, math educators in Seattle Mm -hmm. Public Schools with my contributions. So it's still very much in draft mode. And I think there's a misnomer about using, well, using the term ethnic math. That's not what it is. It's ethnic studies in Mm -hmm. math. Ethnic studies in math. Well, let me just take one of the uh, examples here. Under the theme of power and oppression, it says power and oppression as defined by ethnic studies are the ways in which individuals and groups define mathematical knowledge so as to see Western mathematics as the only legitimate expression of mathematical identity and intelligence. This definition of legitimacy is then used to disenfranchise people and communities of color. So I read that as saying that uh, that there are some people who, because of where they come from, don't think they're, what, allowed to own mathematics or to learn mathematics? Yes, So ethnic studies, the way we're using it in Seattle Public Schools is a critique of the power dynamics that have been created by racial categories and racialized experiences of people, including white people, in the United States. Can you give an example of that, how that would come up in a math class? Yeah. So I think you said it where certain groups of people are led to believe that they're not capable of learning math or capable of being... Um, successful as a mathematician or scientist because it's owned by Western ideals and Western intellects. And there's a lot of research, um, and it's it's very much based in critical race theory, this idea. And so to give you an example, we've had frameworks for the humanities and science for two years, and because we came out with a math framework, people are losing their minds. Mm-hmm. And so that, that goes to prove the point that, you know, white folks, European descendants, tend to think that that's their domain. And or, so now we're trespassing on their domain. Well, speaking as somebody of European descent, I can say that uh, my reaction would be what's ethnic about math because mm-hmm. it's numbers. It's one of those things where there's a right answer and a wrong answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so what we're experiencing right now in Seattle public schools and across the country really is students of color, particularly black and indigenous students, mm-hmm. are not being successful in math. And so the research is telling us part of that is because they don't see themselves in the fields. They don't see themselves in the professions. They don't see themselves in the curriculum. And so, again, it's not ethnic math. It's ethnic Mm -hmm. studies in math. So what we're trying to do with this framework and with the ethnic studies program is have students see themselves in the history of mathematics. And that helps them learn this, the material then? Yes, just like any other material. If you can connect to it on a personal level huh. and relate it to your experiences in your life, you're more interested in it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not conscious of, I mean, I liked math. I loved uh-huh. it. And I, I'm not conscious of loving it because, I mean, I wouldn't even have been able to tell you the name of a famous mathematician to this day or what their race was. I just I just found it. Enjoyable, but you're saying for some people, they believe because they are black, for example, they don't want to learn calculus or derivatives or multiplication tables or things like that? I don't think it's because they believe that. I think we have a lot of bias in educators and education in general that Who don't think that. that minorities can learn? This is still going on? Yes. In other words, they will, if a, if a black kid can't uh, take the derivative of 2x, they'll assume, well, he can't do it because he's black? Yes. Really? And, and there's research to support that, too, where white educators discipline students of color, especially black students, uh, at higher rates than other students. They well, if don't... that's going on, though, how, how is it that, you know, showing some ethnic sensitivity to the students is going to help that? It's the teachers who need would need help in that case. Right. right. And so in order to teach ethnic studies, they need that training. So that's all wrapped into that. So we do training uh, for teachers who are going to teach ethnic studies. It starts with 
what we call racial equity literacy, being able to identify and address racial bias and inequities. Mm-hmm. So, so give me an example. This is a K through 12 thing. So this starts at the earliest grades then, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, pick a grade and give me an example of the old way versus the uh, ethnically sensitive way. Well, currently the practice is to teach to the test because we have such a high emphasis on standardized testing. And so what happens is all that math history that maybe you or I learned, like I went to the, to school in the 80s, and so I probably got more than what students now are getting in math history. So in the elementary school grades, they would learn about those mathematicians mm-hmm. of color and learn about ancient civilizations that created um, math and engineering and things like that that came mostly from Africa and South America and Asia um, before there were even you know stable civilizations in Europe. These these civilizations were creating math and science, mm-hmm. and so in In the earlier grades, that's what it would look like. And then around middle school, high school, that's when they would get into the power and oppression part of that framework where they would learn about how math and science has been used to disenfranchise people. So, you know, just to start just to take a step of time here. So in other words, in in talking about uh, where where mathematics came from, instead of talking about uh, because we were taught about Greek mathematicians, Mm -hmm. I believe. Are you teaching instead about African mathematicians? Uh huh. Or Latin American. Or Latin American mm-hmm. mathematicians. Mm-hmm. Or Asian. Yeah. But they still come up with the same answer in the end, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, that seems like a, an innocent enough change. So then, w- when you start now talking about the higher grades and how math was used to oppress, give me an example mm-hmm. of that. Yeah. So what I'm hearing a lot is people saying numbers aren't racist. That's not what we're saying. <laughs> what we're saying is the way that it's operationalized in in society and governments has been used to oppress people. So one example I use is how, um, you know, there were the, the tests that black voters had to take in order to vote. Mm -hmm. And it it was like convoluted math, you know, things that they knew that the people giving the test knew that people couldn't pass. Right. Right. And um, especially in eugenics, math was used to measure like the skulls of Africans to prove that they weren't (laughs) truly human. Right. But that's been discredited long ago. Um, there are still people who buy into Well, there eugenics. are still people who think the earth is flat. So, <laughs> right, <hang> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's, there are people smarter than me who can come up with way more examples. Um, but those are just a few. And so, and it's not only the power and oppression part. I mean, it's also the liberation part. So we want students, all students, not just students of color. We want all students to understand how math is a tool to make the world better. Mm-hmm. In terms of. Well, I mean, by developing new theories of science allow us to develop new products and things like that. I mean, yeah, is it, there's any question about that? Are there people who just think math is a useless discipline or what? I think we're so focused on just, you know, math is a is a tool to get to the profession that you want and, and have money. Like, especially since math is so integral to, like, engineering and science yeah. and computer technology. And that's just seen as a way to get into a profession or a skilled trade. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with oh. that. And math can be a tool to actually improve the lives of people, like everywhere, not just yourself. Yeah. I'm just surprised that would have to be taught. Uh, but if math was not a good thing to teach in school, we wouldn't be teaching it in school, would we? Right. But that that's, goes back to the testing, right? Like uh-huh. we are becoming an education system that cares only about test results. And we want to get back to the humanity of education that teaches I mean, people. the reason you test, though, is to make sure that people are learning the material. Yes. Okay, so I don't know why we have to do that three times a year, though. <laughs> you think there's too much testing? Yeah. We yeah. have quizzes. I mean, in math, you have quiz sometimes every day, don't well, you, to make quizzes, sure you know this stuff? Quizzes are different. I'm talking about the standardized math that determines oh, how much funding a school gets. And so when, oh. when it's that high stakes, that's high all stakes. you're going to focus on. It's the stakes on. you're worried about. Right, yeah. I see. But it seems to me that math is one of those things where teaching to the test is not a bad thing because it's the, the test. There is one right answer to most most math questions, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So that's that's the kind of thing that is easy to test. You would think so, but what I'm saying is what's happening is we're taking the human part out of it. We're taking that piece about how math can contribute to productive, just societies instead of oppressive societies. We're taking that piece out because all we care about is the test results. We don't care mm-hmm. about humanity or society so i mean the students really want to know why they're taking the test yeah why why we're well, taking tests so you can get a, a job that you'll enjoy and pays well mm-hmm. that's not enough 
No. <laughs> we, they, they want to know how how learning math and passing the math exam will help them create a less oppressive society. Yeah. Why not? Huh. Okay. What what else do you have to say beyond that? That we're not. In other words, some people feel that they are being given the test as a way to hold them back mm-hmm. instead of help them achieve something because of the history of of uh, tests given to black people to keep them from voting. Is that yeah. the still is work, working in certain communities? That's part of it. And the standardized testing comes from a long history of of eugenics movement too. Uh, Ibram Kendi has written a lot about that. A local professor Wayne Al has written a lot about mm-hmm. that. So there is some inherent racism in standardized tests themselves. And so I've talked to Ibram Kendi. He's a very successful academic. I mean, uh-huh. he's certainly taken tests himself and become a productive person. There's so there, but there are still communities you feel who, when they sit down to a standardized test, are the, the uppermost thought in their head is, "Oh, I see what's going on. They're giving me this test as a way to tell me I can't go any farther." I don't think students recognize that at the time, but academics who research the tests and measure the impacts. Are saying that, yes. Well, then what's a better way to make sure a student knows the material? Well, there, I know there's some work being done in New York on portfolio work right. where students show what they know. And so, like, they use it in projects, real-world projects, um, and showing their progress over time instead of a high-stakes, what we call a summative assessment, and that's mm-hmm. the end. And so my belief for assessments is an assessment shouldn't be the end. An assessment should be the beginning. Now you're taking your knowledge and mm-hmm. you're applying it to something concrete. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's fair enough. And I think in, in, we're talking about college admissions. More and more colleges are, are accepting that instead of an SAT, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's, a, I guess, a good development. All right. So what's the future of the math ethnic studies framework? Because you're, you're saying it's not being mandated in the school system now? Not yet. Not yet. But mm-hmm. you, you think it should be? As, yes. And it's you mentioned to me it's been tried in other districts. Well, I've gotten emails and reports from people who said that they're, you know, from districts across the country. Uh, really? Because this thing went viral, you mean? Because it went viral, yeah. So Saying because, that they like it and want to try it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, a teacher in Massachusetts wrote a blog about how she used it in a lesson. Um, somebody that I know from Georgia used it in, in a presentation and... Um, Some Philadelphia teachers are now sharing it in their circles. Uh, And then there's, um, I'm going to forget his name now, Robert Berry, I think his name. He's the president of the National Council of Mathematics Teachers, wrote a piece about it, about how he supports the work and agrees with the framework. So the teachers who have tried it, what have they they reported back to you? Have they seen results? Yeah. They, they, well, I, it's brand new, so I don't know about yeah. results, but they're saying that it makes a lot of sense to them and they support it and they're grateful for the work. Yeah. So... One a perennial problem in education has been the what um, the gap mm-hmm. between the achievements of minorities and uh, and other kids. Well, I guess not all minorities. Asian minorities seem to have no problem, right? But well, no, that's a myth. It is a myth. <laughs> well, because we aggregate all the data for all Asian people, and Asia is a very diverse place. So yeah. if we disaggregate the data, we're going to see some gaps for some Asian students also. And there's a long history of using Asian people as what we call the model minority to, quote, prove that other uh, people of color aren't as good and Asian people just try harder. And so it really... Um, to say that Asians are doing it so everybody else should be doing it is really a racist trope. Yeah. Well, the gap is seems to be persistent, but what you're saying is by using this ethnic studies approach, that is the thing that will close the gap rather than uh, taking a student who can't pass the test and drilling and practicing and drilling and practicing. Is that a fair statement to say? Yeah, and we have evidence of that. I mean, we've been drilling and practicing for decades, and we have a lot of research to support ethnic studies in improving and closing gaps. So what you're saying, if if it turns out the root problem, the reason a kid is not is not making it in math, is because of this feeling of inferiority that has been painted on him by by circumstances. No amount of drill and practice is going to break that. You have to address the underlying. Uh, reluctance of that child to adopt math as his own. Right. Math didn't cause the disparities. Bias caused the disparities. So if you're not addressing the bias and the inherent racism in that bias, then you're not addressing the root problem. Do you 
understand why people would look at this and say, oh, here they go again. Now, even mathematics is racist. Um, yeah, it's just, it comes from ignorance and it comes from the fact that we haven't had ethnic studies and people don't know their history, right? They don't know the legacy of policies like redlining. They think because slavery was in the past, it doesn't impact our current views and practices, which is incorrect. If people know the history and know the context, then I'm sure it would make more sense to them. Um, and so my concern is not with the people who don't get it. My concern is with the people who do get it and who are ready to move forward and change the system. Mm -hmm. When do you anticipate this being adopted by the Seattle School District? Um, well, we're we're currently working on that. Um, it looks like maybe the the spring of 2021. Have you have you talked to parents at all about it? Mm hmm. And what do they say? Well, this whole initiative came from community members. In, it did. in 2017, we had a community task force of about 70 people who came um, to several meetings over the summer. And one of the directives they gave us was it, ethnic studies has to be K through 12 in all content areas. So that's why we now have a framework for math. Like I said, we have it for science. We have it for literacy. We have it for social science. So... Uh, we're creating some more frameworks for the arts and hopefully world languages because the community, including parents, students, higher ed faculty, community-based organization leaders, they all told us that's what they want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this sounds quite benign in the way you're discussing it with me. I mean, it seems like you've figured out a way to actually bridge the education gap and, and you've explained why drill and practice uh, doesn't work. But I get the feeling that, when you try to actually implement it, that it's going to be divisive. I mean, oh, it always has been. Ethnic studies is the result of violent civil protests on college campuses in the 1960s where students were beaten and jailed. And so we fully expect there to be pushback. And I hope that we've reached the point after several instances of this where we understand that the pushback comes from racism and ignorance and that we can dismiss that. But you're not arguing that there is a a black math, an Asian math, no. a Latino math. No. This is about addressing the things that might prevent those groups from even wanting to study math in the first place. Right. Tracy Castro-Gill is the Ethnic Studies Program Manager with the Seattle Public Schools. Tracy, thank you very much. Thank you. Remember that when there's a longer version of the interviews on Seattle's Morning News, you can usually find it right here in the original form, unconstrained by the limitations of a live broadcast. And you can subscribe so that when someone says, did you hear what was on Seattle's Morning News, you can say, not only that, I heard the part that wasn't on Seattle's Morning News. So my advice is to subscribe. And then when we talk to an author, a politician, an entrepreneur, an artist, a scientist, a teacher, a journalist, a celebrity, you'll hear every word. I'm Dave Ross. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.